Welcome to the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast, where you will learn how to identify, evaluate, negotiate, perform due diligence on, finance, turn around, and operate mobile home parks. And now, here is your host, the fifth largest mobile home park owner in the United States, Frank Rolf. We are all aware of the change in fashion, the trends from the 60s to skinny lapels to the 1970s to wide lapels. But how familiar are you with the trends in mobile home park layouts? Because those have also changed over the years, and it's important as a mobile home park buyer to know what the layouts are, what they mean, what the drawbacks are, what the benefits are, how each mobile home park fits into that historical perspective of their overall macro whole. Let's start off with one of the most common mobile home park designs that you'll see as a mobile home park buyer, and that is the shotgun street. Now, what is a shotgun mobile home park? Basically, kind of like the definition of a shotgun house, which is a house that is just a long, skinny rectangle where you can open the front door and the back door and shoot a shotgun through it and not hit any interior walls. In the shotgun approach to the mobile home park, you have a single street and just one street in the entire park. Each mobile home is either on the left or the right-hand side of that street, and it typically just dead ends. They have this strange, awkward ending where instead of having some kind of turnaround, the street just basically comes to a complete stop and you have to pull up into the yard of one of the mobile homes or the parking pad in order to turn your vehicle around. So what is the reason behind the shotgun street? Well, that is back in an era when people had no planning whatsoever for mobile home parks. Someone wanted to build a mobile home park, didn't have a lot of capital, didn't have any know-how. They typically would often even build them in phases. So they'd build the street and it might go up three or four trailers up on the left and the right and stop. Then they got some more money. Once they filled those eight lots, they'd build and extend it up another three or four lots. It's the very most basic way you can build a mobile home park. And it's pretty much universally not liked that much. Nobody feels when they see a shotgun park that they're looking at something that's had a lot of design integrity, a lot of design flair involved. Typically not a lot of pride of ownership unless it has a great location because they're just not that aesthetically pleasing. They're also typically not that large. I've never seen a 100 space mobile home park in a shotgun arrangement. I normally see it on parks that are typically about 20 to 40 units in size. There's nothing really wrong with them operationally. The shotgun seems to work just fine and dandy, except for that strange, awkward turnaround at the end. Of course, the only one who has to turn around is someone who doesn't live in the park because everybody else pulls in their own parking pad and then backs out and leaves the park in that manner. Nothing really wrong with the shotgun, but again, it's not in any way the favored park design for most mobile home parks. Another popular design I call the spaghetti bowl. What happened here is that mom and pop tried to have something a little more imaginative than the shotgun approach, but yet they didn't really know what they were doing. So as each home came in, they would just kind of add on a road at a strange angle here and a strange angle there. And when you look at it from an aerial perspective, you'll see it looks just like a bowl of spaghetti. It's a street system that doesn't have any commonality of the lines, or really anything. Just looks like mom and pop built it out of memory on whims as they went. Some streets only have two homes on them. Some streets have five. Some streets may have 20. The problem with the Spaghetti Bowl Park is traditionally those were built at a time when the homes were much, much smaller. And because there's so many roads running around the park, you can't put very large homes in them. That's problem number one. Problem number two is since they were built at a time when homes were smaller, it's often very hard to maneuver down those roads. I've been in spaghetti bowl parks in Florida where I don't think you could get a mobile home longer than something about 30 feet down the street. So as a result, as homes have increased in size, doubled in size over the decades, and in some cases even tripled in size over what the parks are built for, they just don't fit in those parks. So when you have a spaghetti bowl park, you typically have very high levels of density, very difficult access. Some of the most awkward ones, in fact, only have one lane streets, one way only one lane streets because mom and pop to save money didn't build the streets wide enough to accommodate two way traffic. You can imagine how difficult that makes it to try and get a new mobile home into a lot because the road is barely wide enough for the mobile home itself to even pass down, much less try and turn sharp corners. The number three park, the hodgepodge. Now the hodgepodge, that dates back to an era in the earliest parts of when mobile home parks began. In the olden days, if you look at postcards and read books, you'll see that you had a motel 
along the side of the road, and people would come down the road with their trailer behind them. I'm talking back in the 1940s and 50s, and they wanted to stop for the night, but they didn't know where to put their trailer. So they would go in the office of the motel. The motel guy would say, oh yeah, just park it behind the motel. Over the years, the mobile home park industry grew in stature, but those early motel units, they just didn't. I know you've seen these. These are the kind where they're like little bungalows, often with either parking in front or sometimes with a garage attached to them. Problem is they don't really meet any current ordinances on the way they were built. And also in the modern world, no one stays and stuff like that anymore. So over the years, the motel units became apartments. And what you have is when you look at these properties, you have a hodgepodge of assets all rolled into one. The old motel units, which are now apartments, often mom and pop's original house. Sometime what used to be the original gas station has been converted into a store or retail use of some type. And then you have both RVs and mobile homes really, really densely, tightly packed in together. The problem with the hodgepodge is what business model are you even in? It's hard to sell it to an RV park lender. He says it's a mobile home park. Mobile home park lender says, no, that's an RV park. And then both lenders may say, no, that's more of some kind of apartment motel combination. So the problem with them is typically high levels of density, really hard to find in a home for lending. Not really sure what model it even is. Since we all really prefer the passive approach to mobile home park investing, the hodgepodge takes a lot of the pleasure away from you because you're always stuck with certain things you owned in there, such as those little motel apartment units. So we know it normally see the hodgepodge is typically in the older sections of America where parks first began. Things on the western seaboard, states like California and Washington seem to have quite a few, but you also see them in Florida frequently. Next up to bat, the cul-de-sac. Now, this was more of a 1960s design. The first three we discussed, those are pretty much 1940s, 1950s, and a little bit of 60s. But at some point during the 60s, people wanted to get a little more advanced. Remember that at this point, Elvis Presley had lived in two different mobile home parks and two different movies. It happened at the World's Fair and Speedway. Mobile home parks were a hot commodity. It looked like it would be the bastion of wealthy people going forward. And so some people built a design called the cul-de-sac. Now, what's wrong with the cul-de-sac design? I'm sure you've seen them. You pull in on what appears to be a shotgun street, but then suddenly it goes way round at the end. And some of them never even has the shotgun. It's just cul-de-sac all the way around. The problem when you have the cul-de-sac arrangement is it forces the homes to be spaced in what I would call radial spacing. They're not parallel to each other. They're not perpendicular to the road, but they go like the spokes of a wheel out from the cul-de-sac. Now, the problem with that is, once again, the homes were built, or the park was built back when homes were small, but homes are no longer that small. So the problem today is trying to find homes that will fit this unique radial spacing. If you really think about it, big problems you will have, as you can imagine, is where the road flares off into the cul-de-sac, those first homes are in an angle that is angled towards the last home of when the street was straight. And unless the homes are small, they will actually hit each other. I had a park with radial spacing back in Oklahoma City, built in the 60s. It was very, very difficult to operate because it was very hard to find homes to fit the various slots. Every single lot, in fact, because of the radial spacing, seemed to be a different sized home. And some were so small, I couldn't find any modern home that would fit. Over time, I grew to go ahead and respace back to parallel lots and get out of the entire radial concept. I had just too much trouble with homes hitting each other at the rear, and therefore I had lots I could not use. At least it hearkened the idea of mobile home parks being a little different, a little more on their own, a little more upscale, but the problem was they just didn't have it all together and it really wasn't built for the modern home. And then that brings us to our final variant, the HUD park. The HUD park, is called a HUD park as it refers to a program that HUD had. They were trying to influence better park construction back in the late 60s. I see that most of the HUD parks that we've had normally date from about 1968 approximately. And I would say this is the finest of all the versions of mobile home park. So why is the HUD version so good? Well, HUD put a lot of thought into what they did. Unlike mom and pops, they didn't do it just on the seat of their pants. They actually took architects and they drew out some very far-sighted ideas. They didn't do just what was going on then in the mobile home park specter. They looked far into the future. One thing I like about the HUD park is just how well built they are. The roads are typically extra wide, always paved, very well paved. 
So that's a huge plus. Your road systems are normally really, really good. They always have a parking plan, either on street or two car parking off street paths, which that's great. So you don't have to worry about cars and car congestion. But most importantly, the lots were extra big. Some of these HUD parks, even though homes back in the 60s were not nearly as long as today, they can still accommodate 76 foot three bedroom, two bath modern homes on those lots because just back then they gave people a really extra large yard. Today we're occupying some of that yard with the home. But it's interesting to note that all the way back then, back in 68, whoever designed these parks had the foresight to know the potential was there for the homes to be bigger over time. Also, the HUD Park has some unusual aesthetics. For example, they tried to keep the streets from not being straight shotgun approached, but to having slight curves in them. So it looked a lot more attractive than those early variants. Another great thing on the HUD Parks are they typically have good common areas, normally playground areas, green space, often a clubhouse and a pool. Even though the pool may have gone away from now, the clubhouse is typically still there. It can be retrofitted to a number of good uses for the residents. So the bottom line is that mobile home parks, like all assets, just tended to change over time. They morphed, they improved, they did things based on a modern culture and modern economics of what was smart and what was not. But we really find that we really did do quite a bit of improvement as an industry, culminating in what we would call today the HUD Park. Now, what about Parks 3 Modern? Well, remember that most parks died out as far as new construction in the 70s. Really wasn't anything more advanced than the HUD by the end. Now, today people are building, in some very, very select cases, new parks. For example, there's a community down in Austin being built by a guy named Scott Roberts. I think he's finished it at this point. It's more of a tiny home subdivision, but people are starting to try out new things new wave of amenities and different items. But as far as the typical mobile home park that you as a buyer are gonna see when you're out there looking at properties for sale, those five, the shotgun, the spaghetti pole, the hodgepodge, the cul-de-sac and the HUD, those are the normal variants that you will see. They all have their pluses, they all have some minuses, but overall, it's not a bad way to approach the concept of affordable housing and placing people in organized fashion for a sense of community on a single piece of property. This is Frank Roth with the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast Series. Hope you enjoyed this. Talk to you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast. Be sure to visit us at mhpmastery.com to subscribe to the show, read our show transcriptions, and access all of our great information on mobile home park investing.